simple question for you. What does going to the bathroom in a cave, the body of Moses, marriages, and swords have in common? I mean, it's obvious. No? Of course it's obvious. <clears throat> the answer is authority. Authority, what a great word authority is that no one likes to hear whatsoever or talk about. So I think it's, I would actually like to approach this subject uh, from a different, not a different perspective, but from a biblical perspective. Because I think sometimes it's quite misunderstood when we talk about authority and what that is, because it has really interesting ramifications in your life if you really understand this. When we hear the term authority, though, I think we have some, a lot of times a knee-jerk, I do, I have a knee-jerk reaction. I grew up in a lot of um, <clears throat> things from the past that were overbearing, a little too micromanaged, a little too, you know, black and white, harsh, old school, whatever you want to call a concept. This was all wrapped up in to the concept of authority. And I think a lot of people with old school mentalities, like back in the day, they all used authority for the wrong reasons. And, you know, if I mention that word today, it seems like, though, there's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction completely the other way, though, right? There's no authority. Let's not talk about that. We're all the, you know, equal or however you want to phrase it. Oh, no, not WCG again or, you know, any other type of thing like that. And that's why I think it's misunderstood because it doesn't matter what you and I think about authority. What matters is how it works with God or not. There's only one way to look at this subject. And it's quite interesting when you actually do look at it and see how this works with God because when you probably understand authority, it quite literally can change your life around. It quite literally is a very interesting thing. So let's just jump right in. So turn with me to Matthew 20, verse 24. Matthew 20 and verse 24. And let's see if we can delicately tread through this topic today and understand it better. Matthew 20, starting in verse 24. We've read this before <clears throat> many times. But it says, but Jesus called them to himself, his disciples, and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And we find here that to lord it over, you know, is um, the concept of, you know, dominating. It's the concept of control. It's the concept of, you know, keeping people under your thumb. It's the concept of power and, you know, all of the things that encapsulated as in a human sense. That's how the humans do it. The Gentile, quote unquote, um, deals with or does authority. But it says it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great becomes your servant. So I think we kind of understand this and we think, you know, we understand the opposite to be a, a servant. But is that where it stops? Because, you know, if, you, if you're an authority or there's authority, does that mean that you're everyone's servant? You're just doing whatever it is they want or need. What does actual authority, when we look at it, mean? You know, we read this and think there is no authority. There's only serving. That's not what this is saying here. An authority with God is not about this at all. So um, this subject is, could be big. I'm just going to pick off a few things and go through a few principles today. So the idea is that the world has a one way of authority, one one method of authority. And Christ says it should not be among you. Now, let's turn over to Matthew 7, verse 28 and 29. And let's understand the very first point about authority. The very first point about authority. <clears throat> right at the end of the book of Matthew, he was talking and it says, verse 28, it says, when he had ended these sayings, that they, people were astonished at his teaching. They, were, they could not believe what they were hearing. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So he came across as somebody who had authority. Christ himself, who was the greatest servant, came across as someone who had authority in what he was saying. And we'll find out why he had that authority in what he was saying. But he came across a different way. Now, it goes right into the next chapter. And there's a story that's at the beginning of this that's really, really key to understanding the first point about authority. And that's in Matthew 8. Let's start in verse 5. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority 
having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and the other come, and he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this in verse 10, he marveled. He said, wow, I'm, you know. And he said to those that followed, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down, you know, etc., but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now, this is a really, really key set of scriptures because what was going on here? Why is it called the greatest faith? Why did Christ say that this person had the greatest faith? What we'll find is, <clears throat> is because the centurion actually saw the authority that was in place with Christ. Because what he said to him was the same thing. He says, look, I am a man like you. I am under authority. I know you are under an authority. And I also have people underneath me, and I just have to say the word, and they go do it. And what the man was seeing was, the centurion was seeing with Christ, was the authority that he was under and had, the invisible authority that was there. And he said, look, I know who you are. I know where you sit, and I know what authority you're under you submit to, and I know what's under you. You just have to speak and say the word, and you'll be healed. And that was not some statement of, you know, hey, you're the greatest guy, you know, have you been working out? And it wasn't some statement to butter Christ up. It was very much a statement of understanding and seeing the hidden, uh, not the hidden, but the invisible authority that Christ was part of and recognizing it. And this is what he was saying about it. He says, I am one like you, and I just have to say the word, and I submit too. So one of the other important things that we find out about this is there are a couple things in this scripture is too, is authority is not as much of how you have over other people, but authority, when we talk about the subject, is something you decide to submit to. So you as a person, like this person said, you know, I submit to you as my king and my healer, and I know where you submit to. He was saying, because you'll notice it wasn't just you have people over, I mean, you're over people. A big thing he said first is that you know you are under you are under people, like you are fit somewhere. And so he was saying to Christ that he knows that where the authority he's sitting under, where it comes from, is not just him. And the important first thing to really understand when we talk about authority is that authority is something. It's not for us to rule over somebody. It's more for you to understand, see it, and submit to it, which is super key to understanding how things work with God. Um, and we'll continue on with that thought in just a bit. Right? He saw the authority chain. He thought, saw the invisible there. And we also understand here, too, what's an important thing to understand about authority is authority and faith go hand in hand. Right? When we talk about great faith, this is coupled with this idea of understanding and seeing authority. Because you and I feel like sometimes that uh, faith has to do with, like, man, I'm just not feeling it today, or I just hope I can, you know pull it together and feel like I have faith. Faith very much has to do with seeing the invisible authority there. And if you call upon that authority, and that's something that is in the will of that, this is where things happen. It's not just a, hey, I have some feeling of faith. So faith and understanding how authority are go hand in hand. It's very much faith in a being. It's very much understanding who that being is, what position they hold, what power they have, and what they can do. It's not just some nebulous idea or some nebulous thought or concept. So one of the first things we find here is that this person saw the authority that was in place with Christ. But authority is about who you submit to. It's not really who you are over. And this um, is repeated many times in the Bible. And we'll find out why that, that is an important thing to understand too. So let's continue on. The second thing to understand, let's go to John 12, 49. John 12, 49. What we find about authority, the second thing to understand is that all authority is given by God. God is the one who gives authority. It has to be given. It's not something for you and I to take upon ourselves, but authority is given. So John 12, verse 49 says, this is Christ saying this, For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave a command, what I should say and what I should speak, 
And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. What we find here is that Christ was given authority to say the things that he said. This was not just some person who um, <clears throat> you know, could speak well or say things or was well-versed. God actually gave him the authority to speak. And Christ said, I cannot speak of my own authority. I'm not going to speak my own words to you. The Father has told me certain things to say and to speak to you. And those are the only things that I will speak. Right? So he of himself did not have his or did not take the authority on himself. This is Christ, son of God, one of the God members who still didn't take authority. He had to be given that authority by God the Father. Let's jump back to John 5, verse 27. John 5 and verse 27, Christ says another statement again. John 5, verse 27 through 30, it says, Has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Talking about the judgment he's been given. And he says in verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment's righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of my Father who sent me. And there's a number of scriptures where Christ says this statement, and I can't speak my own words. I can't judge by myself, but only what I have been told and been given. And, you know, this was not a, um, this wasn't him coming up and kind of in a falsely, you know, humble way, like, <laughs> You know, really, I'm super powerful, but, you know, I really can't do anything by myself, you know, <laughs> wink, wink. It was nothing like that, right? This statement is not a false humility statement where Christ is saying, you know, oh, I can just do nothing. He is saying, I, unless I've been given the authority by the Father, I cannot do. I cannot speak. I cannot do these miracles that are in front of you. That is where authority, when you think about it, Christ is saying, I am submitting to an authority which has given me the authority to do these things. And that's where the power comes from, not some other thing that was going on. And so when he says he can do nothing, he is not authorized, doesn't have the authority to do anything except for what the Father had told him. So it wasn't his power. It's not just like, hey, I can wave my hand. He was given authority by the Father to do certain things on this earth, including miracles and other things. And this is how he did them, by that authority he was given, not some other thing that he had, not some gift or not some thing. It was by the power and the authority of God the Father. So when he says, I can do nothing of my own, he means I can do nothing except it was given to me. I can't do it on my own. I can't take it to my own authority. I have to be given the right to do this and the authority to go do these things, and this is what I have been given. So the word spoken, people healed, uh, you know, all of these things were given by God. And God is the one who gives authority. I'll just quote this, but in Revelation 9, verse 5, talking about some of the end-time uh, beast, it says, And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. So we even see that there are limits to certain authority that you know, people, and in this case spirits or whatever it was, are given. That, yes, you have the authority, you can't kill them, but you can torment them for five months. There's a limit, and that had to be given by God. So what we find here is the second point is that authority has to be given. It's something God gives. All authority is given by God. God gives that. And what we find, turn over to Luke 4, verse 5. We see this said in a couple ways. Luke 4, verse 5 through 8. This is the example where Satan was tempting Christ. <clears throat> so Luke 4, verse 5. It says, then the devil, taking him up on the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So he's tempting him. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Right? Therefore, if you worship before me, all will be yours. So apparently at some point in time, the authority to rule over all of the kingdoms of this world had to be granted to Satan at some point in time. That he was given the domain of the earth to rule. That was not something that was, that was given to him at some point in time, when it, whether it was Lucifer, whether you know, it happened after he turned into Satan. There was a point in time where he had to be given that. So therefore, he can say, this has been given to me. I can give it to somebody else if I want to at this point in time. 
That's what he was offering up to Christ. So even Satan the devil had to be given the authority to rule over this earth. So all authority, when you look at it, is given, revoked, or allowed by God for a reason. <clears throat> so the authority over the world is, uh, also had, was given. Also was given. So we find the second thing is that God has to give someone authority. It's not something you and I can just decide to do. That it has to be given authority, whatever authority that is. You see in the Bible authority given a lot of different ways. Kings and uh, apostles and um, uh, judges. and There's all types of authority that was given for a different reason. We also find that some authority God keeps for himself. Turn over to Acts 1, verse 7 to 8. 1, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> it just says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Right? Etc. So the Father himself has certain authorities that he's reserved for himself. And one of those is to know when the end time is, when it's time for it to end and the Christ is going to come back. So the Father knows the time or the seasons. That is, even Christ, he says, does not know. The Father has that reserve for him. So what we see is authority is granted in all different levels, all different uh, spectrums of rulership in the spirit world as well as on the earth as well as church and other different places and these things are given and allowed or done by God and it has to be given by God <clears throat> so it's really important to understand that that their authority comes from a certain place it's not just people who are who are who are taking it so can you think of some examples then if you look in the Bible could you think of some examples of people that recognize the authority this given by God so think this this idea of the centurion where he's coming to Christ and saying, I see what structure you're under and I see where you fit. Can you think of other examples in the Bible where people recognize the authority that was there? A really good example is back in the Old Testament. In fact, turn back to 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24. <clears throat> One of my favorite stories in the Bible. There is so much meaning. There is so much to it. That is King David. And with Saul... In this case, so King David, at this point in time, had already been anointed king. So, by God, anointed king. And he was, at this point in time, on the run from Saul. Um, but the story in verse, 1 Samuel 24 is very, very interesting. Because was Saul doing the right thing? Saul was not a great guy at this point in time, what he was doing. 1 Samuel 24, let's start there, <clears throat> verse 3. He said he, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So he went in to go to the bathroom in his cave. And David and his men were in the cave in the back. And the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Right? And then David crept up behind him as he was going to the bathroom, and he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. But afterwards, after he just cut the corner of his robe, David's conscience was stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave, and he went away. Now, this is very, very fascinating, because you cannot have that kind of faith and make the right decision unless you understand authority. Faith and authority go together because what do you and I do? Especially in a situation like this. Can you imagine if God says, look, I'll take care of it all, or, you know, and you've got all the people around you saying, man, this is a sign from God. Look at this. He's walked into the cave you're, you're in the back of. God knew that. He probably made him go in here and he's delivered him into your hand. And have faith in God because God's giving him over to you to kill him. So when I say faith and authority go hand in hand, you have to be firmly grounded. You have to understand, as David said twice, not once, that God anointed this man. That is not for me to take this person out. That is not my decision. I see that this person has been anointed by God. He understood the authority was there. Now, at this point, like I said, Saul was not a good guy. He was not doing the right thing. He had gone off. He was not a nice person. He was trying to kill David. He had, 
you know, evil spirits bothering him, he, whatever you want to call it, he was not doing right. It did not matter. It does not matter. It's when you think about it, it's who you have to submit to. It, don't worry about the other side of that because God would take care of that here. Now, David could not be grounded and could not have the faith that God would take care of it unless he understood authority properly, who he was under and then who Saul was under, and it wasn't his responsibility to take Saul out. That is a fascinating part of this. So it was able to be firmly grounded in that. It wasn't a feeling. It wasn't a nice thing he did. He wasn't trying to score points. He says there twice. He said it there. Right? Uh, I sh he says, the Lord forbid I should do anything to my master, the Lord's anointed. God anointed this man. Okay? So he said that twice. He firmly understood that. So he could make the right decision where everybody around him was telling him, look, this is the thing that God has delivered to you. And so it's quite interesting. Sometimes I feel like we might fall in the, you know, the trap like his men did, where it looks like things are set up a certain way. And while, you know, maybe God is delivering this situation to you like this, and maybe, you know, this is for you to, to take into your own hands. And it's very interesting, too. What did Saul say when he was hunting David? The whole time he's hunting David, if you, I will turn there, 1 Samuel 23, 7, he kept saying, God has given David into my hands. He kept quoting that God has given David over to me. Like, God is behind this. I am acting on behalf of God. And this is quite interesting, the contrast between the two of them. One could easily say that because it looked like Saul was delivered to David, but he did not say that. The one who was trying to find David, and then the Bible says later, it says, day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. So even though Saul thought that was going on, he was not allowed to find David. And this went on for, you know, some 12 years. I think it's easy for us sometimes to take away things, look what we think they look like, and ascribe maybe God to it and say, and, but if we need to understand the authority that's there or not, and our decisions can be made in faith and very clear and clean. Not in a nebulous way, very clear and very clean. So, and you know, this brings up other points too. When you say submit to the authority, obviously there's an abuser here in the form of Saul doing abusive things. And David didn't have to stay around underneath that. He ran off. I mean, he was trying to pin him to the wall with a spear, right? There, he, didn't, he didn't stay around to be killed. He didn't stay around to get, you know, beaten up every day. He fled from this, but he did not take it into his hands to take care of the problem and to kill Saul because he realized that that was God's anointed and that God would take care of that, not him. So there is a difference here, you know, because there will be a times where authority is abused and that doesn't mean you stay and allow yourself to be pummeled by it or to be killed. And there is a time to get out. And that does not mean that you are not submitting to an authority. You're not taking it into your own hands. So this is what David did. So David's example, if you actually want to go through it, is a very fascinating thing to read over and over again. There's so many nuances to what David did in his life in and around people. Twelve years. Twelve years holding on to that thought. He was delivered twice in front of him. Twelve years he said, no, nope, that's God's anointed. I will not do this. That's one example. There's plenty in the Bible. Can you think of any examples where people took authority to themselves when they should not have? Can you think of examples in the Bible of that, any of those? Anybody think of some? Just Kors 1? Yeah. The rock and the water. Yes. Yes, Miriam and Aaron. That's right. There's a lot of examples, and the two I had written here were the rock and the water and Korah. But <laughs> thank you for giving my sermon for me. To, but these are really interesting examples. You remember Moses? The children of Israel came up to a rock, and what did God say to Moses? What did he say? He said, speak to the rock. What did Moses do when he got up there? He says, do I have to make water for you people. And he struck the rock. Guess what happened? Nothing. And he was like, uh, he struck it again. You know, after a while, God was like, look, I will save your embarrassment right now. And he let the water come out. But what happened to him? What happened? That was Moses taking authority to himself when he should not have. That was not given to him. He did not have some power or gift. 
Think about this. And the same thing as Christ. It's not just some magical person. Christ was given the authority to heal. Moses was given the authority to speak to the rock and water would come out. That was God doing that. It was not some power this guy had. So if you understand authority properly, this is what it is about in life. When we say things happen in life, this is how they happen. This is how things take place. Moses, for this very thing, was kept out of the promised land. We think, wow, it seems like an overreaction, but there was a very important lesson to understand here. Your authority that he's given was not to do that, and he took it to himself. And God says, no, this is not how it works. You overstepped your bounds. You did what you're not supposed to do. That is not how it's going to work. Same for Korah and his rebellion. Some, somebody mentioned Korah as well. You know, Korah, all the children of Israel coming out, you know, Korah was probably a very eloquent dude, right? Probably charismatically charming. I bet you anything, he had a ton of great ideas. You know, we could organize Israel like this. You know, we could hold, you know, meetings. We could, this is, we could go a more direct route. I got all, you know, he probably was this guy who was one of those people you're just like drawn to because he knows everything and he can do it and got all these people following him. He probably had all these great ideas. He probably was way more eloquent than Moses in speaking and anything else because he got a bunch of people following him. But you know what? None of those things matter in the slightest. Right? Because he probably could have been a better leader. Yes or no? He could have probably on the outside and all the appearances of it. He could have led things better. Maybe he did things differently. But you see, none of that mattered because it was about the one God chose. And that's what God said. Look, you know, everybody take your censer and go do this and fill it up. And I will show you who I have chosen. It does not matter how charismatic, how great, or how better you do something. When you understand an authority God put in place with Moses, and he wasn't the most greatest guy who could speak, and he stuttered even, that was what was important, and to submit to that. So Korah and his group did not submit to that, and what happened to them? They chose not to submit to it. It wasn't Moses, like, banging people and, you know, making, forcing them to submit. They had a choice to make to submit to this authority. Things would have gone well. They did not. They took the authority to themselves and said, we should be in charge too. And God says, I will show you who I say is in charge. It does not matter who you think you are, and they all died. Right? We see this time and time again in the Bible, people taking authority to themselves. Because if you honor the authority God put in place, you're honoring the God who put it there. Don't worry about the person. Don't worry so much about that person and who they are and who they aren't. You're honoring the authority God has ordained and set in place, which is different. And we see another big example in the Bible over and over again is that Satan himself, what is his whole beef? And where does this idea originate a lot of times of, you know what, uh, you can't take authority yourself? That's from Satan himself. You know, Satan was the epitome of beauty and wisdom. That's what it says. God made the most beautiful being you can imagine, the most amazing, full of beauty and wisdom was described. And, you know, Satan probably after a while was like, I am amazing. And you know what, I should be, you know, everybody like sees that and I should be here and he, I have a great idea and I can do this, you know, blah, 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 blah. So he rose himself up and tried to make himself equal. He tried to take authority he did not have into his own hands. Again, what happened? He got cast down to the earth. He got thrown down. That is not the right thing at all to do. So understanding authority is very important because you and I can look at the person in front of you. You can think, oh, I don't like this guy, this girl, whatever it is who's in authority. It does not matter. Your choice is, again, like I said, you make a choice to submit to it. That's between you and God. The rest, like Saul, if it's messed up, can be sorted out. But that's not you to not. In that statement, because if you think about it, the way David lived his life, God kept him out of the reach of Saul when you because he, he was submitting to the proper authority the guy was trying to kill him God did not let it happen so you couldn't think of an example today where you're in a worse situation than that probably where you have to submit to somebody who's trying to kill you I don't think you could but you look at the example of David and he survived it because he submitted properly to God not just this man who's doing the wrong thing okay so there's a difference and one of the hallmarks turn over to 2nd Peter 2 verse 10 2nd Peter 2 verse 10 if we look at the end time Second Peter 2, verse 10, a hallmark of the end time is to scoff the idea of authority. So that's what I say. Sometimes, you know, we've, 
come from a place where we're way over here back in old school days, and this is what our view of authority is, but we've swung sometimes to the point where we actually miss what's going on with God. So forget the, the whole, like, hey, everybody's great, I'm not under any authority, swinging way over here. It's important for us to come back to understand where God is at in this because this is really key. So here, 2 Peter 2, verse 11, 10 and 11. It says, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, after their own thing, right? They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, right? Just openly, you know, whoever it is, your minister, public figures, whoever it is, I'm just, whatever it is, I'm just speaking openly evil of them, not realizing that what God has put into place, your job is not to speak. It says here, it gives you an example, 11, whereas angels, angels are greater in power than might than humans, this point in time, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So the angels, the angels who look at these humans who are doing things incorrectly or dignitaries or whoever it is or your president or whatever it is, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before God. They know to stay away from that type of thinking and talk and attitude. That's what Satan loves is that attitude to get you in a place where, you know, all these things are going on and being done to you and you're, these people are blah, blah, blah. They don't even bring a reviling accusation, even though they could, even if they're right. Jude 1 verse 8 is another example exactly like this, which is really good. Jude 1 verse 8. If you could turn there. Jude 1 and verse 8 <clears throat> says, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Here we are again, same thing. Yet Michael, the archangel, one of the most powerful angels, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. So Michael, one of the strongest archangels against one of the worst spirit beings, Satan, who deserves anything to be have reviling accusations against him, did not say anything against Satan, but instead said, the Lord, God rebuke you. I am not going to start down this path of condemning you or saying or doing anything. He did not bring an accusation. He knew that Satan was given authority over earth. He knew that was the case. He knew the authority in place. He knew who he was. He knew who was going to take care of him, and it was not his position. Otherwise, he would be falling into the very same mindset of Satan because now it feels justified. Well, you, should, you deserve it. So he did not speak. I find that example fascinating. The worst example of a person you could ever find of a spirit being is Satan. And Michael would not even bring a railing accusation himself against him. Said God is the one that will rebuke you, not me. That is a very interesting way to look at the authority. Again, you can't think of worse examples in your life than the ones that are actually written in the Bible. Those are more extreme than I think the ones we encounter today. So, how does authority work for you as an individual? Let's get a little bit practical. One, Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. Your faith is based on understanding authority to a large degree. Your faith is in a person who has authority. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. There's a power of darkness over you and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That means He's picked you up from the power. You're under an authority. You are under an authority of this earth. The power of darkness. He's picked you up and moved you into another authority, another kingdom, and another ruler of the Son of His love. That's literally what conveyed means. I picked you up out of the authority of being under this person, and I have set you into the authority of another person, under. You are under the authority of another person, the kingdom of the son of his love. Now think of this on a personal level. That's something you can call on. If you want to get practical and have faith, you can call on that. Something's bothering you. Something's happening to you. You know, think of it like in the movies. You know, you always see people, they're in a foreign country, and they're get in trouble, and all these people chasing them in cars, and they're running, 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 and all of a sudden they see, you know, there's the U.S. Embassy, and it's like, oh, 
and all these cars and guns and things, and they run through the door, and oh, they're safe, right? These movies are always like that. This is the same thing. You're in a hostile world, and you can claim U.S. Embassy, quote unquote, right? It's the same type of concept here. So on a practical level of faith, you belong to a kingdom and a power that's greater than the power here, and you can call on that authority. You have to submit to it. Like I said, authority is not about who you rule over. It's who you decide to submit to. You submit to this authority. You can claim that authority. You can get out of trouble. You can be in that embassy in the middle of the stuff. So on a very personal, practical level, being in the kingdom is not just a nice feeling. There is an authority that you can call on very tangibly. How does it work in your family? There's some typical scriptures, right? We always read, man's head of the wife, blah, 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 blah. Let's read some other ones. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. God has put man as the head of the household and the head of the wife. Why? You know what? Don't know. He did. Did it always be that way? In the kingdom? No. So he just set an authority. Men aren't better or something. God just made an authority there. If you understand authority, your faith can be stronger. Your faith can be stronger. Here's another side of that authority. A man. 1 Peter 3.7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding talking about the wife, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, man who steps out of his authority and does not do this with his wife is not in his authority. That is not your authority. In fact, your prayers are hindered. This is how important God has set this up. You may be over, quote unquote, but your job is to dwell with understanding, give honor to the wife, the weaker vessel, however it means, being heirs together. Otherwise, your prayers are hidden. doesn't matter how you think it is, what reasoning you have in your head, and how you do it, if you're not doing that. Your prayers are hindered. That is an authority. When I say authority, that means man is submitted under God, and God is saying, well, hey, guess what? If you don't do this, I'm sorry, your prayers are hindered. That's important. This is God saying this to the man. We never really read it that way, but God is saying this is what, I don't give you authority to do whatever you want as a man to your wife. I give you the authority to dwell with understanding and to love them. You do that, anything else, you're outside of it. Sorry, you're outside of it. It's not yours. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10. Here's also how it works in the family. Wow, time flies. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10. It says, this is talking about a woman's side, for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Right? So that's a hard statement to understand sometimes, but talking about basically covering of hair and as a symbol where a woman is saying, look, I have agreed that I will submit to my husband and that's an outward symbol of that. Because of what? Because of why would you do that? Because it says here, because of the angels. What does that mean? This literally means that if you're looking for spiritual protection, you, in your family, and as a woman, it doesn't matter, you know, it, the, the point is to have the, you submit, you choose to submit, and that's just a symbol of it because otherwise, if it's I'm not submitting and I'm, you know, whatever, I'm shaving my head or it doesn't, whatever it is, it's just the idea, the concept here. It's what they're talking about. As a symbol of that, submitting to the authority, it's because of the angels. Because the angels see that you're not submitting to an authority God put in place. And guess what they do when they see that? They pick you off. They do things to you. They attack you because you have decided to step out of you submitting to what God set in place. I didn't say this is a perfect arrangement and a bunch of other things, but it's for the protection on a spiritual level. This is not just a nice saying and, oh, I'm not that type of person. or It's something God put in place. Like I said, why did he put man in charge? I don't know. He just did. It won't be that way in the kingdom. But he did today. There's an authority, period, just how it goes. And that is the symbol of this because there's spiritual protection there. There's spiritual protection for you. And your family for that. 
But it goes on here. Like, let's not finish the thought there. Verse 11 is pretty interesting, too. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of the woman. <laughs> I'm in charge of my family. Nor is woman independent of the man in the, in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes from the woman. There's a statement of being together. And that is another authority there of being subject to each other, too. Okay? That's quite interesting. We always read the other way around. Woman submit to, but no, there's a lot of stuff in here, if you read it, that talks about, yes, God put the man, quote, unquote, as the authority, but he also didn't give him authority to abuse his wife. You don't have authority to abuse your wife. God did not say you can do anything like that. In fact, he says the opposite. You can't do stuff like that. That is not your authority. So <clears throat> it's quite interesting. There's also spiritual protection in your family here. Dictating, abusing, controlling, making people submit, those are outside the authority. They're not there. <clears throat> okay, so how does this work in the church? One other thing in the church. Turn to Luke 10, verse 19. How does this work in the church? So here's some very, like, let's just step through a few practical things as we get to the end of this. Or closer to the end of this. <clears throat> how does this work in the church and the ministry? Luke 10, verse 19. It says, Christ was leaving, gave his disciples, he says, Behold, I give... You, the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And that's an interesting thing God gave to the ministry. The word he has given to his ministers over the enemy and evil spirits. This is not some thing you are. This is not some magical power you have. God has put in place and authority there that the evil spirits have to obey. They know this. I've experienced that firsthand before. Been in a room where there were evil spirits. And this person told me, says they know them, but they're not allowed to touch you for some reason. And that's not, that's not anything I am. That is when I, we talk about an in, uh, invisible authority that God put in place, and he gave this authority to the ministers. So he says, don't rejoice over that. But God put that there, and they have to obey that. I've actually seen that firsthand. Seen that firsthand. What other authority is given to a minister in the church? To anoint, right? You, to be anointed, you call on the elders of the church. It doesn't matter who that person is. They don't have some special gift, necessarily. I wish I had the gift of healing. I wish a lot of people did. Uh, it doesn't seem to be present a lot these days yet. Don't know. But it's not about the gift. It's about you knowing what the authority is in place. That's why you're calling that person, because God said to do that. It has nothing to do with how great that person is. I saw someone, I know, take this authority into their own hands. They weren't an elder, and they went around and started trying to anoint people. And guess what? They started having problems with evil spirits, bothering them because they were taking an authority that was not given to them into their own hands. And the spirit world says, I, you're not, you don't have that. I know who you are. And so started bothering this person. So minister had to actually come sort this guy out. Right? So when I talk about authority, when we talk about this, this is a different way we have to think about it. There's a real invisible authority that there that's for us to understand and to us to submit because things work well for you. Forget all the things that are going on up there, but they work well for you when this happens. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Let's turn to Romans 13, verse 1. Let's do a last few scriptures here. Let's talk about a couple other things about the ministry. Quickly, <clears throat> we'll just turn to Romans 13, verse 1. This is a, a very common scripture. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. There it is. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on who? Themselves. Right? We read examples of that, right? For rulers are not a terror to do good works but evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. 
Is it the job of the ministry to serve? Yes. But what does this say a minister's job is to do? Is to bear the sword, the Bible, the word, and fight evil with it. So if you think about the authority that's given to a minister is to talk. There are ideas that are going to encroach this conversation. There's going to be evil that pushes its way into your lives and your minds and your brains. And a minister's job is to take the sword and not bear it in vain, but to rebuke evil, the things, the ideas, the stuff that is there, to devote oneself to the word, to make sure that God's word is preached how he wants it, to put out the ideas that may be creeping around and things like that. That is what a minister does. It's what he says. He doesn't bear that sword in vain, but if you do evil, be afraid. That's why it's there, to rebuke the evil. And that can in, in creep into a congregation easily individual thinking and things like that. So it's very important to speak the truth, to devote the time to the Bible, to the Word, and this is the thing to wield is what is the important part. Turn over to Acts 6.1. Let's read that very quickly. We just have a couple of scriptures here. Acts 6, verse 1 says, <clears throat> very similar concept. So Acts 6, verse 1. This is now in those days when the number of the disciples multiplying there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So they weren't getting food and all the stuff that they needed. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So this is what they did is when they appointed deacons. is to say that we should be devoting to the word of God as a minister. We should be devoting to the word of God not to just serve the table not to do that. So let's appoint deacons who can take care of some of these things so that these people are not neglected. Right? And in, in, down in verse 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, you know, seek out those of good reputation. In verse 4, it says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you want a job for a minister? That's what it is. The authority is given to do that, to battle the evil. The ideas, the things, the things that Satan puts in here to give the truth of the Bible, to put into your lives, your mind, that's what the minister is and to give himself to prayer and that is how it's defined. So <clears throat> Paul was given lots of authority, but like Christ said to Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. That is the primary goal of what the minister does. That's the authority they've been given of the word. Our, you know, <clears throat> that is the job. So any words that I speak, I do not want to speak my own, ever. And I pray and ask God to speak his words because nothing else happens. I don't want some authority that's not mine. I don't want to be something. When God speaks and it's from him, people's lives are impacted. When I speak and it's from me, Nothing happens. Maybe people go, hey, great job. I don't really care. When God speaks, and it's through his authority, people's lives change. Not me. That is not me. And this is the purpose, to understand this, not to take some authority that's not mine. But that is what I do, is devote to the word. Now, 2 Corinthians 13.10, I'll just read this to you. says, therefore I write these things being absent. Paul, lest I being present should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me, why did he give him authority? For edification and not for destruction. Paul said that in another place. God gave him authority. He had huge authority, but it was for edification of people, not for destruction. It was to strengthen people. It was to combat evil. Look at all the things he wrote. Look what he wrote to the Corinthians. Look what he said to them. You're sinning and all this other stuff, but he's not doing it to destroy them. He's actually doing it to root out the evil in these things and build them up so they become spiritually strong based on the word. Look at how many arguments he cast down, how many books he wrote, and how many things that he wrote that were really sophisticated to the you know, hardest arguments. He did that for the edification and not the destruction. So when we see that that's the role of what a minister does, if we want to look at the church, that's the example that they should be. So to wrap this all up, only scratching the surface, there's so much more you can talk about on this topic. But if you understand authority properly, submitting to it will result in a blessing to you. Let me just say that. 
Okay, this is not me saying something so I can, I want to control people. You need to submit. That has nothing to do with that. It is when you submit, if you understand, like we talked about, the centurion saw Christ. He says, I see who you're under, and I see who's under you. I submit to that, and guess what was blessed? His servant was healed just by speaking the word. He understood authority properly, and his household was blessed. Right? <clears throat> We're not lording it over, but it's more about who you're subject and submit to than it is about the concept is about over people. And the miracles of God are not just some gift given to you. Think about this. Some ability, and we look for an ability or just a gift and say, I wish this was what I had because I could do that. It has nothing to do with that. Because Christ only could heal because he submitted to the Father, and Father gave him authority to do that. And he passed it on to his disciples to go do as well. Authority has to be given to do that. Right? It's about submitting. Christ said he could do nothing. It wasn't some power he magically had. He submitted in, under an authority, and that authority and that power went through, and that's how he could do those things. So sometimes we look at a gift as if it's the thing. It's not the thing. Do we try to take some authority to ourselves? The thing to ask first is, have I been given this authority to do this by God? Yes or no? Ask that first. Don't try to take it yourself. It doesn't work like that. Christ himself said this. It wasn't a nice saying. I can do nothing except it's given to me by the Father. So let us not, you know, if we think about gifts, we need to actually understand faith. The authority behind it is the more important thing to get firmly grounded in how this actually goes together and works. Should be a blessing for your house. Children, honor your father and mother. You will live long on the earth. Okay? God put an authority there. You honor your mother and father. Hard thing to do for some mothers and fathers. But it says you will have a long life. You're blessed. Think about this. You submit, you're blessed. Again, the example of David and Saul, God can take care of things where people are wrong and off and other things like that. Another blessing, like I said, is spiritual protection for your house. Look at the Proverbs 31 woman. She submitted, and she had protection, and she had the favor and the backing, and she was out doing a thousand things out in the world, buying and selling property, a whole bunch of stuff. That is a blessing of the submitting part of it. Okay? It's the opposite of what we think it is. So again, it's who we submit to. Think of it that way. And your faith can be so much stronger if you understand how God has set up authority and you decide to see that, live it, and submit. You. Don't worry about the rest. God will take care of the rest as he took care of Saul. But you can receive that blessing. So what is going to the bathroom in a cave? The body of Moses, marriages, and swords have in common? Obviously, right? It's authority. 